Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this panel is being recorded at the University of Winnipeg, which is located on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, the heartland of the Métis Nation. The water at the University of Winnipeg is stolen from Shoal Lake. This panel is also occurring in care and solidarity with Indigenous students, faculty and staff, who are also leaders in conversations and actions against systemic and structural race-based violence and oppression. The panel is entitled Structural Racism and the University. And briefly, the origins of this conversation come in complement to a statement that the University of Winnipeg issued in relation to anti-black racism and the ways that it affects students, faculty, and staff on our campus and in our communities. This panel is a collection of um, black people's experiences and expertise in their research areas, but also in their engagements with institutions of higher education. Um, I'll introduce our panelists now and then our um, moderator for this discussion. Tiane Diop is in the final moments of completing her MA in Cultural Studies curatorial stream at the University of Winnipeg. She holds a BA in history from the University of Manitoba, and her research focuses on intersectional queer representations in museums. Dr. Chigbo Anyaduba is assistant professor of English at the University of Winnipeg, where he is both a creative writer and literary scholar. Dr. Anyaduba's research focuses on African literatures, black diasporic literatures, genocide studies, postcolonial critical and cultural theory, and creative writing. His research has appeared in numerous journals and edited collections. Dr. Paul Lowry is Associate Professor of History at the University of Winnipeg, where he teaches and writes about race, disability, cities, labor, and time. He is the author of Forging a Laboring Race, the African American Worker in the Progressive Imagination that was released by NYU Press in 2016. Other writing has appeared in the Canadian Review of American Studies, as well as collections published by Oxford and Duke University Presses. Dr. Elia Kim Sabanda is Professor of History and Head of Graduate Studies, Joint Peace and Conflict at the University of Winnipeg. His research focuses on African liberation movements, um, agrarian policies, biographical and oral histories, race, gender, and class in 20th century Southern Africa. He's the author of The Zimbabwe African People's Union, 1961 to uh, 1987, A Political History of Insurgency in Southern Rhodesia, amongst many other articles in prestigious journals. Today's moderator is Dr. Delia Douglas, who joined the University of Manitoba in 2019 as the anti-racism practice lead in the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. Dr. Douglas earned her PhD in sociology at UC Santa Cruz, and most recently taught at the Institute for Gender, Race, and Sexuality, and Social Justice at UBC. Her research on race, gender, and sports has appeared in the Journal of Black Studies, the Journal of Sport and Social Issues, and Gender, Place, and Culture. Dr. Douglas joins the panel today as an expert scholar on systemic racism, inequality, social justice, black studies, settler colonialism, critical race, and gender studies in higher ed. Thanks. Thank you very much for that introduction, Jenny. Uh, so, for the viewing audience, um, just to give you a little bit of information about the format that will ensue. Uh, we have a series of questions. I will read out the question and then each of the panelists will have an opportunity to respond to the question individually. Uh, after that, there will be an opportunity for the panelists to speak to each other. And uh, if it's appropriate, then I will jump in. And if not, then we'll just carry on to the next question. Okay, so we've got a series of three questions with a few questions uh, broken down in between to accompany. Okay, so let's begin with question one, which is as follows. What is your understanding of structural racism and how it functions at the University of Winnipeg in particular and post-secondary uh, education more broadly? And I will begin with Chico, please. Thank you very much. 
So I, I think that the question of what is meant by um, structural racism is, uh, is not a very simple one. Um, and depending on who is defining what structure means and uh, what structures are constituted by, um, I think the question can generate quite different um, uh, responses. But a rather common metaphor is generally used by some scholars uh, is the image of structure as sort of a mansion. And so usually such mansions of oppressive power uh, are constructed in ways that structure the relations between occupants of the mansion. Um, okay, um, so, so uh, such mansions um, structure different kinds of relationships between occupants. Um, so who uh, is living at the upper level of the mansion and who is living at the lower level and, and so on. Um, so when we say that oppression is structural, I think that what, you have, what uh, we are usually gesturing at is um, a kind of widespread uh, um, social norms and institutionalized practices that establish hierarchies in, in social relationships, in economic and political uh, relationships. Um, so in the context of racism, uh, structured forms of racism, I think, um, operate based on the organizing forms of racial hierarchies, um, which, as we know, ranks whiteness, right? As, um, uh, as, as uh, whiteness above every other kind of um, racialized uh, identities, in you know, whiteness as superior and blackness as inferior in that sense. And blackness has always in a position of inferiority and servitude. Um, so such structured forms of oppression would always impede the mobility of those people who's racialized, say, as black or as non-white. Um, and would generally, as I see it, put blockades in place to keep people in um, their expected positions. You know, whites always above and blacks below, um, whites as administrators and um, non-whites as the administered and so on. And to give you a kind of um, a minor example of what I mean in the context of the university, uh, last year I, uh, I was at an awards event and I think Kim was there as well. Um, uh, and, and one professor approached me when, uh, where I was seated um, at a table with some other colleagues, including Kim, um, and asked whether I was a graduate student of uh, one of the professors there. And I said no, that I was a new hire in the English department. And he said, oh, wow, good for you. Um, and then leaned closer and asked whether I was contract. Um, <laughs> now, I, I don't think that this particular fellow was being malicious. Um, if anything, I, I think he was actually very friendly. Um, and I've had similar kinds of uh, scenarios play out at different times. In fact, last year, when I joined the University of Winnipeg last year, I had more than six episodes like this, <laughs> right? Within the university at events organized by different departments in the university, right? Um, so, and, and this generally happened with older professors or senior members of the university administration um, consistently, right? So it's not a one-off or an exceptional situation. And to me, uh, these encounters are not surprising, <laughs> frankly. Um, for me, they spring from that mental structuring that automatically tries to fix things in their place where the mind generally expects uh, you uh, expect those things to be. So if you are used to seeing something in a particular place and suddenly finds it um, where it's not usually seen, <laughs> so I, I feel that what happens to the mind is that automatic response to restore that thing to its place, you know, where it's supposed to, to be. So that's, for me, the nature of um, structural racism. Um, but as, as, a, as a cultural critic who in the past few years has been invested in studying the cultural representations of genocides and the meaning and place of culture before, during, and after genocides, um, 
I am becoming increasingly more inclined to looking uh, a little bit below structures. Uh, so if structural oppression is like a mansion, then you will generally find my scholarly attention giving more to, to the things that make the mansion functional. In other words, it's infrastructure. Um, so infrastructures are generally those underlying structures that make the building serviceable and operational in different forms, you know, the electricity connections, um, the water system, the sewage systems, and, and so on. Um, and in fact, I think infrastructures underlie cultural practice in different forms. Um, infrastructures are usually invisible and more diffused and, and very dispersed across uh, structures and they are quite flexible and adaptable in different forms. Um, they are also not locatable in one single structure. You know, they connect multiple structures together. And I think that racism in the form that we, we encounter them these days, I think they function more strongly at the infrastructural level as against the structural level. Not that they don't structure this, uh, function at the structural level, they do, but I think we don't pay so much attention to the uh, ways that the infrastructures of racism operate. Um, so I also think that oppressive systems are increasingly investing more at the, at the infrastructural level. Um, so uh, in, in, to, to, to uh, conclude on my responses to, to this question, um, I, I think that in the, at the University of Winnipeg, for example, we can locate the infrastructures of racism um, in, the, in the kinds of administrative policies of the university, the traditions and habits and privileges encoded in these policies. Um, we can locate them in the hiring practices, in the ways that access is distributed um, across uh, the university, and the pedagogies and curricular activities that uh, sort of come together to make the university function in the way it functions. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Yeah, that's a, a, a very hard act to follow and a wonderful introduction to uh, this, as you said, very complex question of uh, structural racism, institutional racism. Um, I, as a historian, I'm very interested in the ways in which uh, forms of knowledge production uh, directed at and, and engaging with uh, historically marginalized uh, communities and people of color inform the larger institutional and structural practices uh, of the university. So as you've outlined uh, these, these issues of infrastructure and, and institutions, um, as a scholar of color and as someone who has spent all of their adult life in uh, post-secondary education and uh, academia, uh, I think we also have to really interrogate the modes through which peoples of color have historically been uh, objects of inquiry rather than agents of inquiry, uh, of, of problems to be solved uh, writ large in this way. I'm, I, I'm reminded of the work of, of Lee Baker, a cultural anthropologist in the U.S. who speaks of out of the way and in the way peoples. Uh, and here at the University of Winnipeg and at universities writ large is sort of how I'm imagining this. Uh, but in particular here at the University of Winnipeg, I think this is especially apt uh, as it relates to uh, black scholarship and indigenous scholarship and in that these are two groups that have historically traded uh, this sort of out of the way or in the way peoples, depending on the historical context. Um, so I think until we come to grips, and again, this is hardly a... a, a uh, a simple exercise or one that's going to be solved um, overnight, we have to look at the ways that universities, universities in their modern iteration, I'm talking from the, the late 19th century, uh, as institutions founded in empire, founded in colonialism, founded in subjecting peoples of color, as I said, as objects of inquiry, and, and I think in, it, it is very pervasive as problems to be solved, even we mentioned perhaps from benign or well-intentioned or not overtly malicious uh, perspectives, but certainly with this notion that these are problems and they can be addressed and they can be studied and then they can be solved, uh, which of course has a really deleterious effect in, in the ways in which the, the humanity and the agency of, of people of color uh, functions in the academy. 
So taking the large, scale, uh, taking the large view uh, of that, of how do we start to address those issues, how do we parcel out knowledge production, uh, I had a, just to use again a personal anecdote, when I was in graduate school at the University of Toronto, uh, I had an advisor of mine uh, who, who was actually an external advisor of mine, which speaks to the paucity of, of, uh, of uh, academics of color in the Canadian context. Uh, he was uh, from an American institution and he, he counseled me to avoid uh, appointments to black studies departments. Now, that's a double-edged sword, right? In terms of this attempt to, on the one hand, ghettoize and marginalize scholarship, right? By uh, people of color, about people of color. But again, the double-edged sword, as he readily admitted, being the further marginalization or erasure of those voices. That's again, a contradiction, but I, I thought that was quite interesting at the time. Uh, and I was at first taken aback, but when, you know, reflected on it further, I understood uh, the point he was trying to make. So I think when we, come, when we start to dissect the ways in which knowledge is produced and to center the agency of scholars of color from a pedagogical and research perspective, that will infuse the larger institutional uh, culture, perhaps. And so we might be able to affect a bottom-up rather than a top-down uh, uh, exercise in trying to remedy, uh, remedy the ways in which uh, scholarship uh, by uh, faculty of color uh, is addressed both in the university but, and the University of Winnipeg uh, specifically. Thank you. Um, I think those who have spoken ahead of me have done a pretty much good job. And where do I insert myself in this uh, discussion? Um, I think institutional racism, which is seen as systemic, which is a term that I always struggle with because it implies that it is unconscious and, uh, <clears throat> and is used very much as a, as, as a fig leaf excuse uh, so that people feel very comfortable because if it's unconscious, um, I don't believe it is. I believe it's calculated is systematic rather than something that is because somebody sits down and plans something. So there is some deliberation and calculation there. So where I'm going to insert myself on this, they've already spoken to the issue very well, is that in institutions is also seen in the distribution of opportunities and, and the resources to back up those opportunities. And, and uh, that's something that happens uh, even at our university as well, uh, passing on some people, and uh, especially people, racialized, uh, uh, I want to say majorities, rather minorities, I, I, and I take that again uh, with some qualifications. So you have that, there is this, uh, what Michael then calls, Michael Omi calls uh, inferential racism which is institutional, distribution of opportunities, distribution of resources, representation in, in, in places where decision making is, is done. Uh, perhaps where there is not only responsibility, but there is authority, which means one can change a lot of things. So there is, there is thus to me that inferential uh, as opposed to refer I mean, referential uh, uh, racism, which is something to do with flipping somebody a bed or sneering at somebody or simply avoiding some. So I, I, I think I will just simply add that at this point, that it is in terms of distribution of opportunities and resources and also making sure that there is representation at all levels, and, and that systematic, uh, systematic, systemic <laughs> racism basically uh, means that somebody gets to a point where they do things at ref reflex, they don't think. That's basically, it's not really a term that, 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 that honors people as such. And they end up with some story too in, in this. I remember when I was being interviewed, um, 
I was asked since I'm teaching African history, if I were going to try to teach people my language. And, and uh, I had to bite my tongue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I thought the people who were in the room were going to try to, to address that in some way. But there was dead silence. So um, what was that? Did they not feel it? Did they not hear it? And, and also in those instances, universities also uh, is great because, I mean, not it's great. We, the instances where uh, racialized minorities, I, I hate the word minorities, uh, majorities, because not really, uh, are, are treated as props. When you are given a position, it means that they just want to use you there as a curtain raiser. And just some responsibility without any power or authority, like I have said. So it boils down to opportunity resources, representation in all levels of people. If you are in a committee and you look around and you find people who are just the same, you should begin to ask yourself what's wrong with this picture. And uh, if you are in a committee and you find that there is a recycling of the same person over and over and over, even if it's a person of color, you should be, again ask yourself what's wrong with this picture. So those are the things that I can say at this point. Um, I think that for me, one of the things that I want to start off with is the first note that I put in my notebook for today is quite telling. Um, I put down that um, anything that I share today is not to point fingers or to single anybody out. And the reason why I felt the need to say that is because I'm here as a student. And so that speaks to kind of the power dynamics and the structures that are in place. But even just pointing out that there is structural racism at the University of Winnipeg or that there is a culture um, of structural racism at the University of Winnipeg is a risk. Um, but I will continue with the University of Winnipeg in particular because I think that the, the other um, panelists gave a, a really good overview of structural racism as a whole. Um, something about the University of Winnipeg, which I find is quite particular, is that it markets itself as a progressive university. Um, it markets itself as a university that is um, very much invested in social justice. And that means that structural racism operates in a different way here than it would at, a different, at another institution. So you might see it more through tokenization. You might see it more through um, the institution or individuals um, being so attached to the idea that they are one of the good ones, that they, they are not part of the problem, and therefore making it so much harder to address these issues. Um, so I, I, I want to really um, hammer in that point that um, deciding for yourself that you are um, progressive and um, invested in social justice, that means that there's social capital for you to be gained um, for the way that you interact with us. And that means that it also is more difficult for us to um, address the issues that you are a part of and complicit in continuing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, is there additional conversation that you would like to speak to each other um, before? I th have a few thoughts from what people have said, so before I jump in. Do you... Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, just some of the, th the conversation has prompted me to think of a few things in relation to um, systemic racism, and one was the connection between um, physical structures or physical space and and mental structures and mental space. So that is, I'm thinking of systemic as the ways in which universities are um, predominantly white spaces that are not identified as racially structured spaces. So the ways in which whiteness remains invisible in that context. And so that when, for example, Chigbo describes, you know, those repeated encounters. So it becomes, um, it becomes a racially marked space when a BIPOC person enters that space. But up until that, a predominantly white space is not seen as a racially or a racialized space. And so, in other words, crossing the boundaries reveals the boundaries. 
Um, I'm also thinking about structural racism in terms of the predominance of whites as administrators, um, as faculty, so that we still remain close to 80% across the country. And so that that is an example of systemic racism, although it's not identified as such. Um, and thinking about the ways in which underrepresentation is tied to knowledge production. And thinking also about the relationship between post-secondary institutions and settler colonialism. So understanding the university as a key component in the reproduction and maintenance of settler colonialism. And thinking again about the physicality so that universities are located on indigenous lands, unceded and otherwise. And so what that means. And thinking about, you know, we have land acknowledgements now, but beyond, to what extent is that beyond a gesture of symbolic anti-racism, right? And so if, we, if less than 1% of faculty across the country are Indigenous, they are the most underrepresented, what is that relationship, for example, between something most basic as we offer a land acknowledgement, but in terms of any other acknowledgement or any other relationship, that is not not simply named because we want to go beyond naming, but if we're not even naming, then we're not even identifying it and then therefore responding to it. Um, and I guess the most obvious thing that I want to just close this part of the discussion is how can you not know, right? When you look around to Kim's point of, you know, you look at these spaces and how is it that you cannot see this profound visual imbalance, right? I mean, again, we can get into the conversation around, I don't see quote unquote color. Well, you have to see it in the first place to not see it, but we apparently just don't even get there. So just wanted to put that out there. All right. Um, any other uh, comments or remarks before I move to the next part? Yes, Tiani. Um, one thing that I guess I can add to you as a student um, is that um, structural racism directly compromises my education. Um, a lot of the professors um, here who are not um, racialized as black, indigenous, or people of color don't have a good understanding of what structural racism is and how it operates. And I mean, they tell on themselves through their, um, <laughs> through their syllabuses, they tell on themselves in class. So it's, it's something that is quite easy for us to pick up on. And um, that then means that these are the people who are supposed to train us. These are the people that we are paying our money to get an education from and to advance in our careers in. And they are not able to provide that for us. Um, so just as an anecdote, one of the things that I started doing at one point um, during my program here is that whenever I would write something um, about race, and race is one of the areas of interest that I study, um, I started just interchangeably using different terminology that means different things in my essays. And for the most part, people would not point that out, and that's just a basic editing thing. You know, like if you're training me, you should be able to recognize that. And if you're not able to or not comfortable um, editing the work that I submit, then you are not doing your job and you are compromising my education. So it does have very direct consequences as well. Thank you. Yes, Paul. Yeah, I, I really like that point about it compromises your education. And again, to be anecdotal, um, I was the only at the largest university in this country in my graduate program. There was one other person of color, one. And this is at a school of 75,000 students, right? Uh, and one, uh, two, I should say, uh, uh, black faculty members, but one of whom was contract. Uh, and so a, a complete disparity. And so if that was to be addressed, it goes back to this notion of blackness is problematic, that we need to hire or we need to infuse token sort of gestures to curriculum or to faculty, but it still marginalizes black expertise and black uh, knowledge as being a, a solution to a problem rather than right an entity in and of itself so just you know my experience is in your experience as well the discussions that administrators might have will be how do well how do we address the concerns of this black student or these black students right rather than how do we uh, acknowledge black expertise and black genius in that sense 
Thank you. Kim. I just remembered one thing. Uh, and, and I think it has been mentioned by both I mean, uh, before, which is the issue of no, neutral policies. And neutral policies come in two ways. One is by saying, well, we voted on this, and this is the, the, the will of the majority. And people don't step back and ask the implication of that policy because they think it's neutral, it's objective, it has nothing to do with what is happening. It's just as good as if, say, a, a person of color is studying their own culture, they are seen as, they say, well, this job is, I mean, this work, the findings here are not going to be trustworthy because you are involved. But the, people don't really think, if, if, if a white Canadian is studying Canada, that never arises as an issue. What I'm simply saying is that, I mean, even here in Winnipeg, at the university, what we have to, to do is literally to begin to interrogate some of those policies which we think are neutral. Uh, and I think we need to be a little bit ideological, I may even suggest. And, and that's when we will begin to uh, see before we don't see. Is, and, and yes, just to simply say, the, the issue of neutrality, where you say, well, it's the will of the majority, and we forget that there is sometimes the tyranny of the majority. And in, in, in a democratic and revolutionary society, no, progressive, perhaps it is too hard, um, one has to think about what are the implications for the people who are not included in this will or who people would not vote on that. Can I add to, add to that? Um, there's also the danger of um, pigeonholing so-called black uh, professors. For example, most um, uh, positions, say, in the Faculty of Arts, um, reserved for black professors, you would notice across many universities, say in Canada, you would notice that they are already forced into disciplinary angles. You know? So you rarely find black professors, for example, studying anything outside of blackness <laughs> or racism. And so our expertise, our um, ability to produce knowledge is also sort of um, ethnicized. Um, and, and you know, circumscribe within this frame where we can only speak. Our voices matter only when we articulate our suffering and our experiences of racism. And outside of that, then we are not subjects of, you know, as Paul um, puts it, subjects of inquiry and, and knowledge production. Um, so it's, it's when we say we, the universities need, for example, to change the hiring policies, I think it also spreads um, beyond that a tokenistic way of hiring people to fill um, a gap in. <laughs> we don't have black professors or black scholarship in this department, so let's get someone black to teach black scholarship, right? So we racialize even scholarship and knowledge in that sense. Mm -hmm. Well, and two other structural components that I would also speak to is one is the fact that Canadian universities do not have anti-racism policies. And so that in and of itself means that racism is not considered to exist. So, you know, put that up against now conversations around systemic racism and people struggling to figure out what that means. Well, in part because it's so pervasive, they don't see it and that's, you know, as long as we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. Um, but I also think to the question of curriculum, to the tyranny of the majority, uh, if universities make their claims that they are leading, that they are excellent in all of these d different components, and yet the narrowness of the curriculum or that it only speaks to a very small segment of the population means it's identified what it sees as knowledge, as relevant, as you know, experience, etc. cetera. Um, that is also in the service of reproducing and maintaining settler colonialism. And in Canada, under the narrative of we are multicultural, you know, all these different pieces speak to um, and rely on each other. <laughs>
is everything. Well, welcome back, everyone. We've just had a 10-minute fire drill interruption, uh, which might be viewed as a disruption to a conversation around systemic racism, but I think it's important to include that in the conversation as we were not forewarned. Um, so I begin with the next question, which is, what is the state of black scholarship at the University of Winnipeg? It's not in there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's true. There's, there's nothing like black scholarship uh, in the university that I know about. Um, at least to say that something exists, there has to be recognizable structures. Um, <clears throat> we don't have anything to suggest that there's anything like that. Even at the curriculum levels, um, at structural levels of the university and, and units in the university, so it doesn't exist. Um, <clears throat> many of the courses I introduced uh, last year and earlier this year were very new. Um, my students, some of them never heard of the word diaspora, for example. They never heard of the word post-colonialism, for example. Um, and some of these students are students who are taking second degrees, right? Um, <clears throat> So it doesn't exist, is my simple answer. Thank you. Yes, the reason that it's perhaps telling that that sparked a laugh from all of us when you, when you asked that question, uh, that there isn't. I mean, there, there's a collection, a small collection of us who teach issues, uh, teach uh, racial issues and racial history, uh, but there's no coordination, there's no institutional support of that. Um, and this is obviously very, striking at the University of Winnipeg, uh, it all, of course, you know, applies to many other uh, universities. I'm always reminded of one of my favorite articles by uh, Adolf Reed, uh, leading African-American uh, scholar, What Do the Drums Say, Booker, which is sort of a, an, a critique of the role of, of black scholarship and public intellectualism in terms of to what we were talking about before, that its service is seen as explaining blackness and explaining racial structures to uh, whiteness. So hence the, you know, invoking the sort of colonial uh, films of, you know, uh, as natives are, are at, native peoples are asked to decipher the mysterious drummings of the people to the, to the, uh, to the white explorer and the like. So I often feel as if that is sort of our role um, both on a curricular level, but also as, we're, as we delve into the public realm to say, explain this to us, which of course there is a role for that. It's not, there's a, those of us who study this, that our expertise can be used in that sense. But again, it's seen as being framed within the problematic and it's seen as being framed in almost an anthropological sense, as you mentioned, Kim, of like explain this, this mysterious heart of darkness to me. <laughs> to overlay even more uh, colonial <laughs> things on, on stuff. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I think the, the, uh, <clears throat> the story I told about the question I was asked by somebody who was very senior, are you going to teach in your own language, was very telling and instructive. Uh, in other words, um, uh, it meant that there was some fear that that kind of instruction, which might be representative of how I think, not on about how they want me to think, and it was 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 dangerous, and it it had no place. While we have some things, for instance, like African history, we teach a little bit of this and that, of the literature and so forth. Uh, I mean, just like I said from the beginning. It's resources that count. We can have all the libels we want, but we can just let somebody playing soccer. There is a playbook that is representing a game that is not there. 
as long as there is no substantial resources that back up not only those courses, but research in those areas as well, to be very practical and functional. If we, if, if people of color sometimes hear the university, just to be frank, got something for research, they'd be very lucky. Why? Simple because their research is not interesting. And is, uh, some of the research is not really, and the, the, the election is not based on any criteria that you can simply say this is really very objective and so forth. And is based on uh, who is popular. And uh, because of the problem that you have, you as a person of color in the first place, you are not really that popular and you are studying subjects that are very uh, strange, bizarre, and therefore uh, sponsoring your research is just as good as putting money into a red hole. I know I'm putting it in a very picturesque way area, but that's what it is. So those black studies are not there in the sense that there is nothing that supports them. And the people who are doing them are not really supported in, unless if they got some crumbs that fell off the table. And then they can do, without any research that is going into that, without any resources that are provided, without any uh, campaign for a number of, uh, for some students who are going to be funded. If you look at the funding, most of the funding really is not for African students here, be they local, let alone international ones. Uh, we have those that are uh, in different uh, departments. I can say that as having been a chair in history for five years, I, I saw what, where things were going. Or even now is um, in working uh, as well as chair in, in the, uh, the joint programs, uh, peace and studies, uh, University of Manitoba and University of Winnipeg. So there is that, and, and the students who are doing th those courses, some of them will have to come down here and do an independent course to do something that is uh, strangely African history, which is not really supported, and, and just one person doesn't make, uh, let me just end up with this, up until um, until I, I, I got into this, I got the position of being chair, I'm not chair, of being historian here. University of Manitoba and University of Winnipeg had one African historian. Robert taught at those both places. And when, when I got the position and uh, there was talk of that, Long story short, I say, well, the money might be good, or that's good doing that, or there is precision doing that. I'm not really interested because it kills the area. And that's what it is now. If I go on vacation, there is no African history that is going on. All right, so basically that's what it is. And I'll pick up where you left off because both in my undergraduate and in my graduate studies, there has also only ever been one professor that is racialized as black in the departments that I was a part of. Um, so as much as I agree that there is no such thing as um, black scholarship because it is not supported and there are no structures for it, what I'm seeing is the, um, the professors that I have that are racialized as black, um, and I'll also include the professors who are racialized as indigenous and people of color because there are so few black professors. Um, I see them get overburdened um, I see them try and provide me support and structures so that I can get trained and so that I can get the education um, that I deserve. And uh, they don't have any supports in place for them for that, but they are doing their best to mentor those of us who are in the institutions. And they do that on their own time and they do that out of their own goodwill. And so um, if universities and larger structures want to pat themselves on the back for the people who are coming out of these institutions and who are graduating out of these institutions. Um, it's not because of the university, it's because of the individual labor of the professors who decided that we were worth mentoring. Um, and we graduate because of them. Uh, and we graduate for the most part in spite of the other professors. Thank you. I think that your examples 
uh, offer the weight of the statement Black Lives Matter because whether it's through erasure, invisibility, um, the fact that there's laughter in, in asking the question around the state of black scholarship in its absence, um, which of course is at the same time a presence, right, is that um, black life as educator, as knowledge producer, um, as field of experience and history, participant and creator of history, that silence, that invisibility is example of systemic racism, you know, of the meaning and significance of the affirmation and assertion that black lives matter, right? Um, I know Kim addressed this a little bit, but I'm going to ask, uh, go around again and ask people to specifically address um, what are the barriers that you see with respect to um, implementing support and change in terms of black scholarship specifically or anti-racist scholarship more broadly? Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I, I think the barriers are already some of the things we've been um, hinting at. Um, I, I think I want to focus more on what I mentioned earlier on the infrastructural kinds of barriers that, that I noticed, which um, for me are very entrenched in the very culture of the academy itself. Um, the academy is is run on you know something Kim mentioned on on setting assumptions about what it means to to study some of the kinds of things I study. So if I apply for say research grants, and there are two or three people uh, <laughs> meant to receive the grant, the the likelihood that it will come to me I already know um, is, is is low. Um, not to talk of the fact that uh, mentally I have to exert myself over explaining things that ideally I shouldn't explain, um, explain the importance of racism and why <laughs> we should study that, um, over explain certain kinds of um, uh, structural oppressions and injustice in ways that I find um, not just exhausting but also uh, intellectually um, not rewarding. Uh, so, so in terms of institutional forms, uh, and again, even even getting publications out, you know, uh, so so some of these politics and cultures uh, practices put in in place over time is to recognize that some of us are um, struggle against enormous odds, and that these odds, I I don't think they are things that can change overnight um, because they, they are the ways the institutions have been functioning for many years. So infrastructures are always very um, difficult to do away with because they ensure the effective functioning of things. Um, we recognize them when they fail and that's when they fail for those, those infrastructures are designed um, for. Uh, so, so for me, I, I, I think that it's... Um, I don't know how <laughs> these things can, can be done away with. I'm not very optimistic. I'm, I think I'm so much invested in, in a different attitude to, to the kinds of scholarship I do. And optimism is not part of it um, because I don't think optimism helps uh, in that sense. Um, so it, it's, it's forced to acknowledge that these things are there in very heinous ways and the, the ways they impact um, the kinds of work that I do. And I don't think it's my work to figure out the solution. <laughs> uh, um, well, we talked to, about what some of those barriers are. Um, and I would echo those comments in terms of you know, as people laboring in the humanities, we're already under a pressure to reveal the utility of our work. That's something that, you know, it informs all uh, humanistic discourse. There's the double burden, of course, though, of trying to frame the utility of 
scholarship that critiques racial structures that again is not seen as being, perhaps being seen as too theoretical or too abstract or too detached from, from you know, real world concerns in that way. So perhaps somebody in, in a social work department, is it's easier for them to make that claim for the utility of their, of their research than it is working in things such as English or, or, or history or, or sociology. Uh, so I would say that. Uh, I think that's a burden that all uh, scholarship, particularly black scholarship in Canada, suffers from. And you talked about that in terms of the sort of, it, it's, it's unseen because it's seen to not exist in this sense. Uh, but I'd also link it to issues of students and the critical mass of students that is also required in an institutional setting to frame the utility of said research. So I think issues like student retention, particularly amongst students of color, amongst indigenous students, and here I'm talking very practically, sort of nuts and bolts, and when the administration looks at it and says, well, you know, the, the, you have this, the number of, of black faculty you can count on one hand, and then you have very few students, and so your irrelevancy is sort of compounded. So I think we also need to look at ways of how we address student mentorship and student success and student retention. So we can have that critical mass of students. And again, not all, I think we talked about ethnicizing research, not all of those students have to be funneled into particular race specific disciplines. But if there's a larger critical mass of students of color, that also makes our job to make the case for our utility as much as we all might not like to make it. That's just, but again, we all have to do it. So I think if we focus on issues such as that, and you know, here at UW, we're, it, it's very easy to talk about the accessibility that we offer to these students, but we're not particularly good or adept at monitoring those students' success and deciphering things such as retention. Right? So we can put them on our pamphlet, uh, and we can brand ourselves in that way, but we know that, especially amongst indigenous students, right, we know the retention numbers are very low. And so how does that link to our scholarship and our utility? Yes, I think what uh, Thibault and, uh, and Paul have already said, perhaps just to add a few things on that, is uh, I think the question really is that of ne um, threading the needle uh, between rhetoric and practice, w w what is real. And, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think in terms of these structures and, and scholarship, until we, we begin to diversify all committees, uh, there would be some intentionality on the part of leadership. Um, I think an institution is as good as its leadership is. If the leadership doesn't value that diversity, it's not going to happen. If they don't value the, 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 that, then we will end up being in some of those uh, rhetorical stances that we, we put forward. Yes, our, our university in particular, of course, is, is progressive in, in a number of issues. It will say, well, we're taking leadership on this and that. But when it comes to those issues that really matter, uh, it is a dollar short. Uh, so it's th that, that is, again, I would just simply say, although it's just a simplistic, sloganistic, or whatever stuff, diversify structures, empower those people who, not empower, give opportunity, because people empower themselves. You give opportunities, there are already a lot of, provide resources that are given to everybody. Look around the room and see who is there. And, and they'd be troubled by what you see. That's the beginning of something. And then I'll end up by saying, diversify in this position, my position is that the, the leadership which has this mission statement, I'm putting it now on the leadership. And whoever is put in a position of leadership, I think when they are evaluated, they should be evaluated on the basis of meeting objectives that are set on the missions and also on what they are going to do. I think I've seen a lot of statements about we want to diversify, I mean, to, to, to diversity, we want to have everybody else at this, and when people are, are campaigning for some, some positions, which is good and noble. But at the end of the year, I think there is a disconnect between that evaluation and the goals which they set 
as they presented themselves for the positions. So and, and listen, until we get to that, I, I think the, all that we are doing will be just trading water. Um, I'll pick up on the leadership as well. Um, so I, I don't know much about the leadership structures here. I don't know who sits on which committees. I don't know who has which job. But if I'm looking at the state of affairs, um, it leads me to think that the people who are in leadership positions now, they're either not actually invested in making any change because there, is, there hasn't been any for a very long time, or they're unqualified to be able to make any change. And both of those are issues, and that's, I think, where um, the situation needs to be addressed is kind of the people who are in positions of power um, need to be people who are um, willing and able to directly address structural and systemic racism at this university. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things that uh, comes to mind for me is thinking about um, Paul talking about students. And if we back this up for a second, so there's been a great deal of visibility, obviously, around um, anti-black racism with respect to policing. And here we are talking about it with respect to uh, the University of Winnipeg in particular. But I, I'm thinking, and it's a challenge, how do we uh, make connections across different institutions? Right? I think that's an important piece of the conversation. So I'm thinking, even if we're talking about junior high and high school, right, in terms of the kinds of supports that, that youngsters get, um, opportunities, you know, the opening of their eyes, um, encouraging them to pursue, um, to figure out what their dreams and desires might be. You know, what kind of spaces are, are available right now for black, indigenous, and racialized young people? Um, because part of what we see in university is a reflection of what's going on before that. So we need to talk about, you know, obviously we're talking about families, we're talking about a whole different set of connections. But, I, but I'm thinking, you know, about whether it's museums or whether it's universities or whether it's policing, like the, the intersection of these different institutions um, and how do we see our relationship to them in terms of, you know, this particular moment um, what might intervention look like? Um, what do you see as feasible and possible? And then I'm linking that also to the next question, which would be, or a closing question really, which is around um, what role do you see the university playing uh, in terms of black scholarship in particular, um, but also anti-racist struggle more broadly? So I know I've thrown a lot out, but you know, pick the pieces that you might want to speak to um, going forward, because I'm also mindful of, you know, time and expanding the conversation and things that you might want to talk about individually. So, okay, we're gonna re, we're gonna, we're gonna have, there we go. We're gonna have equitable responses. We're gonna switch direction. Uh, it is and it isn't. Okay. They intersect and overlap, so. Yeah. Um, I'll be short. I think I'm just going to um, echo what some other people have said, which is that um, I don't really think that it's up to me to fix or propose how to fix these structures. They're not structures that I helped create. They're not structures that I helped perpetuate. And they're not structures that benefit me. Um, for me in particular, I'm here as a student. I'm paying money to this institution to educate me. I am indebting myself so that I can be here. Uh, so I'm not also going to put in free labor to help them figure out how to fix this. Like if you want to put in place some structures that value the labor that goes into coming up with solutions, like maybe then we can talk. But for now, like, it's your job. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I, I think adding to that and uh, also broadening it up a little bit, <laughs> I'll simply say, I, I think most of the discussion has been uh, that, you know, Blacks, so people of color have to teach the dominant group how not to discriminate against them. And, uh, and, and in that, the, then they will try to tinker around with, the, with the whatever institutions that are in power to, 
But what I'm simply saying, I think right now, if the university wants to do that, it's going to be a joint venture. I've, I've already said um, uh, there is no more teaching. I think people know. Uh, I, 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 I don't really want to, uh, to believe or refuse to believe that people don't know what is racist. And when they form committees and they exclude others, that they don't know that they are excluding others. I, I don't just buy into this systemic or unconscious racism. I, I believe every move is calculated uh, to include and exclude. And, uh, and I, I think the university, if it plays that model where we walk away from the group thing, where you have a homogenous group of people, and over time when they do that, they really, you, you get into dysfunctionality because what you are aiming at is consensus and, and obedience to the group. Once there is that, if we get out of that group thing by moving, bringing in different perspectives, which means different people who, who, who are there. So uh, if the university is still at the risk of being um, propagandists, uh, it's just to diversify, give real power, open opportunities and be, the mo be a model to the outsiders as well. And, and before you actually preach at them about what it means to be progressive and uh, all in I mean, inclusive. I mean, I would absolutely echo those two statements, and, and particularly that it's not the it's not the job of, of students of color of, to, or indigenous students to to carry this burden at all. Uh, and to Kim's point, I think for for those of us uh, faculty of color, I do think you know the time for discussion is over. We're very fond here in Canada of white papers uh, and the like, and and I think I think having innumerable discussions and committees and and you know we need a redistribution of power, we need a reallocation of power uh, uh, structurally, and while there is always that double-edged sword about uh, embedding yourself in structures of power and the, and the assimilationist and corruption that comes with that, personally I just find that in that case that the perfect cannot be the enemy of the good and that if we surrender that field to, to Kim's point, the, you know, these committees in, in perpetuity that look the same and speak the same, then we will fail to move forward. So it's not a, it's not, it, it's not a, a wholesale solution to uh, take those large-scale structural, and because there is much debate we know about, right, is this a form of co-option, is this a form of tokenism, but for me the alternative is not desirable because that's total erasure and total censure, and I don't think that benefits us in any capacity. Yeah, so I, I quite agree. Um, the way I see it is to think, sort of to recognize um, that the academy, um, especially the Western Academy, um, has, and in, in connection with some of the other institutions, you know, the media, the police, and so on, um, these are sort of preceded largely by sanctioning what Spiva calls ignorance. Um, through purposive for me exclusion of non-white people as uh, subjects of knowledge or, or as experts um, and a kind of commitment to patrolling the colonial borders of, um, of, of the academy for example. Um, so in, 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 so I, I think I understand the academy as part of an infrastructure of a broader structure of racism in the society. Um, so I'm teaching a course on post-colonialism at present, and I focus the course on what I call schooling as a colonial practice. And um, I asked the students last week whether the University of Winnipeg is still a colonial school. Um, and you needed to, to read the responses. Um, <laughs> um, it, it, um, because, and, and I asked that, um, not because I, I wanted to play a trick, but because it meant quite a lot for me as a Nigerian immigrant professor in, in, in teaching here. Because if the university is colonial, then what am I? <laughs> um, am I complicit in that colonial project by virtue of my 
being part of it, right? So it's, it's a recognition for me of how dependent um, both uh, beneficiaries and marginalized folks, um, how dependent we are on these structures and infrastructures of racism. And, and because of that dependence, it makes it very difficult to begin to think of how to dismantle them. I'm not uh, the biblical Samson <laughs> who would pull down the structure and then destroy himself in the process, right? Um, so, so how am I carving out, you know, um, or thinking about uh, the academy in that sense and my position within it in the ways that, that it's functioning? Um, I, I think that as an academic confronted with these monumental structures and infrastructures of racism, um, I think I have resigned more to a scholarship of pessimism, right? Um, a scholarship of negativity, which for me is a very serious political act of protest against the kinds of scholarship of hopefulness and positivity that, um, that I find a lot in social justice scholarship, <laughs> you know, especially social justice scholarship done by privileged um, white professors. Um, and, and, I, and I think that cynicism is not bad, <laughs> right? I, I think it's a very usable attitude to deploy against the kinds of ceaseless regimes of, um, of oppression that continue to subjugate racial, uh, those of us racialized as, as black. So my scholarship of negativity is the reason that I study mass atrocity and racism and genocide and colonialism and the ways that these things function. Um, it's the reason that I orient my uh, pedagogy largely to um, the kinds of things that Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator, uh, would describe as the pedagogy of um, a kind of problem-posing pedagogy, which, um, which is a kind of education that consistently and critically sort of intervenes in, in reality in that sense. Um, so who knows, maybe such an approach would unveil for me the reality of oppression and, and also help me and my students um, sort of make us hopeless, <laughs> right? That's my goal, um, to become hopeless with the current state of things because I feel if we are hopeful and positive, then there's no point to change. You know, we don't recognize the urgency um, for some other people who are on the other side of these oppressive structures and infrastructures. So maybe hopelessness is, is something <laughs> to work with in, in that sense. Kim. Kim, well, um, that's very interesting. I mean, the, uh, I mean that, that pessimism, which is not Nihilism, I, I think that's what you, um, but I think there, is, there are things to be hopeful for. Both hopefulness and uh, pessimism are not a strategy in, in a certain sense. Uh, until they are, strategy, they are used as a strategy and an inspiration uh, for change, I, I think then that's when they begin to be constructive for, uh, for all of us. I, I, I understand uh, the situation really of being pessimistic when you look around. And yet, uh, I think Black Lives Matter, for some of us now who are a little bit older, uh, uh, the changes that have been at this time effected in some areas are not only monumental, they're very substantive. Uh, for instance, in, in Denver, I was just reading something about what happened in Denver, and I was going like, wow, this is really very interesting, because the governor signed into law a bill that uh, um, uh, ends qualified immunity for police, that you can actually sue police now in Denver civilly. And, and also that you cannot shoot somebody in the back when they are running away from you. And that you cannot just stand by when you are witnessing something that, I mean, an atrocity that is happening. And if you did, you can be fined uh, as much in, as uh, up to, I think, 250,000, if I remember correctly, and of course, lose your jobs, your job. Um, and that, although of course it didn't come to me as something that was largely surprising in Denver, as a place that I've lived in for years, 
I, I could see and also participated in commission of inquiry against excessive use of, of force by police. Um, that came to me with the climate when things changed as something that did not only put hope, but of course you were right, hope is not a strategy. Pe positivity is not a strategy, but until it's strategized, all this to simply say, there is still hope, my brother, for getting into these things. Uh, engagement, we have to and we must, uh, as Paul was saying. And, and uh, we don't really have the luxury not to engage. If pessimism would make you engage, so be it. And, and, and there are quite a number of things that we are seeing around us that um, are making things change. I mean, fundamental changes like I have given as, as, as an illustration. And I'm sure, I mean, what we saw, most of us who went to this march where there were uh, thousands of people, I think the, it was put at about 150,000 people who came out here to, pro, I mean, to, to, to protest against not only police violence, but also just oppression and, and, and structural racism, something that has marginalized people and put them in this abject poverty. So there's still hope. No, strategize <laughs> if it is bad. Yeah. 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 So pessimism is a form of strategy that I sort of um, uh, merge with the way I'm doing my scholarship. Um, but it's also to not lose sight of the fact that systems of power are very smart and they are usually two steps ahead. Um, you know, the, a few years ago we said, yeah, in, in the case of the US, put cameras on police guys and then shootings would stop. And they did that, came up with all the fine policies, but the killings continued. Even when we see clear cases of lynching, <laughs> you know, people sit down, watch those things, and say nothing is here, and you know, <laughs> the guy has been murdered um, legally. Uh, so so it, for me, it's to recognize how, over the years, the responses you know, that people used to consider as positive could also be um, a strategy of immunization, <laughs> right? Um, which is what the Italian philosopher Roberto Esposito uh, theorized in the concept of how we solve problems, you know, um, is to vaccinate. And sometimes to vaccinate is to introduce into the body that which threatens it <laughs> in a small dose, right? Mm -hmm. So all the things we've been talking about um, against tokenism, it, it functions like that bring in a black person and then use that black person to build this sense of a stable community here. Um, so let's introduce these laws and it's going to, and, and then it vaccinates the system from criticisms, right? We did protest and the prime minister gets there and takes a knee. Who are we protesting against, right? Because the prime minister is there, he's taking a knee, he's solidarizing with us. Then we are not talking to anyone actually. So the system already finds a way to create these spaces that give us a sense that we are actually advancing and doing very well. And then it's <laughs> using that, um, using our strategies of protest against us. And then we cannot protest anymore after all. The system creates these spaces of protest and encourages us to actually protest, right? We are always skeptical, healthy, skeptical of things. Uh, you say, here are lions, you say, I wait for the dust. You know, and we say, you know, a mouth can cross the river when it's full. So, um, Nilling, I think, I think the Black Lives Matter have taken us beyond uh, the question of uh, having the Premier kneel with us and saying, they are part of us. Uh, I, I think it's, it's time we begin to look into, is it all sheep here or there is a wolf inside? And as we, like I say, uh, my culture says, sometimes we go out looking around for some disease when the disease is with us. <laughs>
So I think that shouldn't really make us complicit. That's something that should educate us to some of those systems of adaptation. And uh, for instance, the cameras, which of course, initially the cameras were meant, uh, I can say that about uh, in the States and in Denver in particular, uh, where I went to the School of uh, uh, Civilian and Police Academy for a year, um, what they were meant for initially was to try and protect police. Because when they tried to effect a, an arrest, somebody, they said somebody would head themselves and then blame it on the police. So they fitted those cameras in order to protect the police. And, and the later on, of course, when people jumped and said, well, of course, we want that. But I think, I, I think it is, what we are saying is something that is very deep. We should not just be seeing things that are happening at the surface and uh, embracing them as, as change. And, and, and uh, all the symbolisms, for instance, the statues that come, roads must come down. Now, Abraham Lincoln should come down, I never knew that there was somebody kneeling. Down. I mean, I, I used to be there all the time, including, but I never saw that. Or we beat the American Museum, which is an indigenous person and, an, and, and a, a black person, both on both sides uh, at the entrance. And when we see those symbols uh, being eliminated, but not thinking about what May, what do they symbolize if those structures don't fall? Then I think you, you, are, you are right, we're in trouble. Uh, our time is up. So I, in terms of some mm -hmm. profound closing remarks, I will simply say this. Uh, this is a particular moment in time where people are protesting for justice during a pandemic which is revealing existing inequities and exacerbating existing inequities. In terms of where we go from here, that script remains unwritten. So this is an opportunity for us to have this conversation and I thank all of you uh, for the opportunity to have this conversation and let's keep the conversation going. That would also be something new and different. Um, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you and spend time with you.